Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invite to this very nice conference meeting. I'm affiliated with the Danish Center for Sleep Medicine in Copenhagen and I'm also affiliated with the Technical University of Denmark where I did my PhD some years ago. I'm a biomedical engineer so I normally do research within uh, the automatic development of or development of automatic detectors for various microsleep events or development of sleep models that can help advance the way we analyze sleep today based on data-driven methods, machine learning and advanced signal processing technique. But today it's true, I want to talk about the REM sleep in blind people and we wanted to see why or how these people have uh, sleep features, in specific in the REM sleep but also in uh, non-REM sleep and in specific for this study how their nocturnal eye movement activity looks like. So as you may all know, there are these specific um, patterns or characteristics in the different polysomnographic signals. And these characteristics determine which sleep state you're in. You mainly look at the EEG, the EOG, and the EMG. And there are some specific patterns here that are indicative for the different sleep stages. You see down here the very characteristic rapid eye movement, which also gives the name for the rapid eye movement sleep. And since their discovery uh, many years ago, people have been asking why do we move our eyes doing sleep. We have our eyelids closed so we cannot see, so why do we have these periods during the night where we move our eyes? Before go trying to answer that question, I want to say that uh, in contrast to skeleton muscles, the muscles that control eye movements are not blocked during REM sleep. Eye movements are normally controlled by cortical and subcortical regions, and the components of the specific eye movements or the saccades are controlled by neurons in the lower brainstem areas. And these neurons are superior to the neurons that are responsible for the normal atonia that we see during REM sleep. So that's why we actually are, or can move our eyes during sleep. But more interesting, why do we do it? A lot of hypotheses have been set up on this. Maybe the most popular one is the scanning hypothesis, which basically says that eye movements represent specific expression of the visual, experiments, uh, visual experience when we dream. But there are also some other hypotheses, especially we say that, or it has been hypothesis that we uh, need to move our eyes during sleep for lubricating the ocular surface, or we do it to stabilize or stimulate the circuits that have not been su in, uh, sufficiently activated during waking, or it, they are just merely a random discharge of a more active central nervous system. So what we did in this study was to try to see if <coughs> to valid or test the validity of the scanning hypothesis by measuring eye movement activity in blind subjects and correlating these to their dream content and specific their visual dream content. So the hypothesis is that if eye movements reflect vision-like processes during dreaming, then the, these should be absent in the congenitally blind subjects, but preserved in sighted controls and also conserved in late blind participants, but to a lesser degree. This is the data that we uh, have in this study. We included 11 sighted controls, six subjects that, were, or that became blind uh, during their lives, so late blind participants, and five congenitally blind participants. They do not differ in sex or age or sleep efficiency and neither in their overall sleep architecture. Of course, their blindness duration index differ between the two groups of blindness, or two groups of blind participants. The blindness duration index is a measure of how long time you have been blind during your life. So a measure of <coughs> one means that you have been blind your entire life. Blindness was of peripheral origin, affecting the retina or the optical nerve. There were no medical or psychiatric disorders, and there was no, and it was not, uh, there was no medication interfering with sleep in this uh, patient or these subjects. And of course, no underlying sleep disorder as documented by cardiac, respiratory, and motor activity records. So this is the study setup. Uh, the three subject groups were first going through the screening, screening process. After this, we, did, uh, we asked about their dream content, the sensory elements of their dream. We did that over a 30-day long period where we asked them about their visual, their auditory, their tactile, their olfactory, and gustatory elements of their dreams. And based on this 30-day period, we couldn't compute the frequency of these components. 
and also for the late blind participant, we interview them about the specific elements of their visual dream. So more in detail about their visual dream concept. Also for these participants, we did a in-hospital polysomnography. We detected the eye, mo eye movements automatically, and we also did a manual scoring of the hydrograms. And based on these, we could measure their ocular activity in each of the sleep stages. The automatic eye movement detector is uh, based on the two raw EUG signals after high pass filtration, which is the pre-processing step. We did what we call a cleaning of the EUG signals. We basically decomposed each of these <coughs> signals by using a method called the dual tree complex wavelet transform, which basically not only look into the frequency contents, but also into the phase of the signals. So that means that we could threshold both the frequency content, but also the angle between the two eyes, or between the two uh, signals. So by thresholding this, we could eliminate all the components of the signals that do not have something to do with eye movements, and only uh, including those that do. And based on that, we could re-compute um, the signals, the two clean signals, which is shown up here. So these are the raw signals, and these are the clean ones, and you can see that all the Patterns that reflect eye movements are still maintained, but the patterns that do not reflect eye movements, maybe this one is not, they don't have a high enough angle between them, so that's why it's not demonstrated down here. After that, we did uh, amplitude difference between the two clean DOG signals, that's the black line here. And we did a threshold on this, that's a red dotted line. And we only, uh, and, what, and by doing so, we got these eye movement candidates. And we did another process, say, that we combined the closely separated eye movement uh, candidates, and lastly, we elim eliminated the two short ones. So we ended up with this vector saying that this first period of this epoch contains eye movement. So we do not detect individual eye movements by using this method. We merely detect the periods or the whole uh, bunch of eye movements that are present. Because this method is developed on sighted controls, we need to do a post-validation of it. We did that by taking uh, three congenitally blind subjects and three late blind participants, and two independent scores manually detected all kinds of eye movements in the first sleep cycle. And based on a consensus of these two scores, we compared the automatic detection detections on these, and we obtained these accuracy measures an overall accuracy measure, measure of around 95%. The lowest obtained was for the nocturnal wakefulness, which drops to 87.9%. But as you can see, all of these accuracy levels are pretty high, and we, uh, we, said we <coughs> think or thought that this was high enough for the purpose of this study. So to the results, these are the eye movement activity for the three groups. This y-axis says that this is percentage of each of the sleep stages containing eye movements, so a high of 40 for the sighted controls here, uh, means that approximately 40% of the nocturnal wakefulness is, co is containing eye movements. And as you can see, both uh, blind groups had significantly less eye movement activity in all of the nocturnal stages except the very deep sleep. There it is where also sighted controls not show that many eye movements. Looking into the frequency of the sensory elements in dreams, we saw this is a visual, the auditory, the tactile, olfactory, gustatory, and we found that the congenitally blind subjects have significantly less um, frequency or lower frequency of the, element, <coughs> of the visual elements in dream compared to the sighted control, but also compared to the late blind controls or late blind participants. And they had a significantly higher frequency of the olfactory elements compared to sighted controls. So the most interesting uh, results of this study is maybe this uh, uncoupling, because we see that the late blind participants do not show any eye movements during their REM sleep, but they do not differ when they report the visual content of their dream. We did some correlations measures. Here we did some correlation to the blindness duration uh, index, and we found a negative, significant negative correlation between the blindness duration index and the visual dream content. That means that the longer you have been blind, the less uh, visual content you have in your dreams, which makes sense. It might be very much driven by the two subjects down here. 
and we found no correlation measures between the blindness duration index and the actual eye movement activity seen in any of the stages during sleep. If we looked into the correlation between eye movement activity and the elements of dream, we found a significant positive correlation between the percentage of REM sleep covered by eye movement activity and the elements of the visual or the visual elements in the dream, and a significant negative correlation when we compare this to the gustatory and the olfactory elements. These correlation plots are when we include the sighted controls. If we exclude these or not include them in the correlation measures, we see that these two are not significant anymore, we still find just a significant positive correlation between the uh, percentage of REM sleep covered by eye movements and the frequency of visual elements in dream, but just significant and highly due to this one subject up here. As I said, we ask more in details about the visual content of the late blind participants. These are the things that we asked about. I'm not too sure if you can read it, but familiar faces, unfamiliar faces, Scenes, landscapes, houses or buildings, animals, objects, persons, colors, flashes of light and other light patterns. And all of these late blind participants have a lot of simple forms of visual elements, but they also report some complex ones. If we compare to a very old study in 66, uh, where we, Hall and Van der Kessel, uh, did some reports of what is the normal population, the normal seen components of, the visual, of their visual dream content, in a normal population, we see that in specific, the unfamiliar faces are very low in the late blind participant compared to the normal population and also just the report of persons in their dreams. So trying to conclude on this, um, we have some studies or some results that might um, support the scanning hypothesis. The considerably blind subjects uh, both lack visual dream elements and also the eye movements during sleep. So this could support the scanning hypothesis. But we also have this uncoupling between the eye movements and the uh, visual dream content of the late blind participants, because they do still report that they have visual dream content, but they, do don't, or they don't show any eye movements during their REM sleep. Although I'm not a, an expert on PTO waves, I might say that we explained this and we came up with some possible explanation for this, the likely uncoupling of the dream content and the associated eye movements in late blind participants. It might be that during the compensatory cortical plasticity that is seen when you, could, when you lose your vision, the PGO waves might be altered or absent due to this plasticity or cortical plasticity. Uh, it might also be that they're still intact and they remain present and they still activate the visual cortex, but the, acti but the cortical activity is not followed by the eye movement uh, activity. But we can for sure say, based on these results, that the, there will happen an uncoupling between the actual <coughs> eye movement and the, uh, or the feeling of visual content of your dream, in your dreams, when you lose your vision. We have some limitation of this uh, study. Uh, we only have a small sample size, 11 sighted controls and 11 blind subjects. The correlation measures in specific should be considered with caution. Uh, we also have late blind participants that have been blind for years, the minimum Blindness duration index is 0 0.22. It could be that if we take one that just been blind in, we can see maybe normal eye movements in these patients or these subjects. Uh, and the last limitation of this that I will mention is that we did not do any control laboratory awakenings. So we did the, the visual <coughs> content of their dreams or the elements of their dream were based on the, the period of 30 days when we asked about their dreams. And the measurement of the eye movement activity was done on a night not included in this 30-day uh, period. So by that, and before the red light, I want to <laughs> uh, acknowledge all the co-authors in this, specifically Sabrina Orpin, who is uh, shared co first co-author of this, but also all the other very <coughs> talented uh, researchers involved in this, and of course all their institutions. And thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think the red light is about to go on. <laughs> uh, questions? Hang on, I have one here. Vlad and then... So, uh, uh, as we know, uh, dreams happen not only during REM sleep, but there is a lot of dreaming during non-REM sleep. Yeah. Uh, how do you reconcile this notion with your result? Uh, 
Well, we do not know from which states they reported their dreams. We know that we asked them upon awakening, so it most likely is during REM sleep, but you're right, we don't know. We can see that the eye movements, um, they don't show any eye movements, also <coughs> not in non-REM sleep. So there's still this uncoupling of it. Um, but yeah, we don't know whether it's from the non-REM sleep or the REM sleep, the dream elements. Hi, thanks, Julie. Um, do you have any measurements on the muscles controlling the saccades and whether that's difference between your group or participants? No, we do not have any measures of that. Um, and also, we did not do a, a fully investigation of their light perception. Um, so that's also a limitation and also their measurement of how able they are to move their eyes. We don't know. We can see that they, some of them do move their eyes during wakefulness but we didn't measure it systematically. Uh, can I follow up about the light perception idea? Because, of course, in our yeah. studies of the blind, this is the driving force is. Uh, determining whether a, a blind person has a free-running, non-24-hour sleep-wake cycle or, or an entrained sleep-wake cycle. So uh, did you have no totally blind people? Did they all have some degree of light perception? Not. Well, it was based on subjective yes, reports, but, but, but they said no. The congenitally blind mostly said they did not see anything. Also. No light no, at no all. Lights, yeah. I see. Okay, so in fact, most of them were totally blind then. Of the congenitally blind, uh, yes, I think so, yeah. Right, so, so that would explain then their low sleep efficiency that you show <coughs> in your first slide because, because probably they're having yeah, the it's cyclic uh, uh, sleep problem yeah. that, that will give you a low sleep efficiency. Yeah, and but it's still in this small cord, the, it didn't differ between groups, but mm -hmm. yeah, they had a bit lower uh, sleep efficiency mm -hmm. in some of them. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Julie? Well, if not then, thank you very much. <laughs>